Uh, I've given several talks already this week here, and what one one thing I want to do is I'm going to introduce you to sort of the, the sort of the, uh, the arc of some of the big projects that I've been involved with over the years. Um, uh, in 20, 2004, as most of these are projects that I proposed uh, over the years. We did a big 74-page project on climate change in 04. In 07, uh, we did um, a piece on uh, disappearing glaciers. Uh, this started the, uh, oh, is it not working? I'm just going to boost your mic over. Hang on. Are, am I talking now? Better. We're better now? Thank you. Okay, so then in 2007, this project on, on melting glaciers, and it started the the ice uh, career of Jim Baylog, who's a Boulder, Boulder uh, Colorado photographer, he started a project called Extreme Ice Survey. And what he did was that he put 28 time-lapse solar-powered cameras around the world and he monitored glacier loss. And it became a film called Chasing Ice in, I think, 2013. We did special issues. We did a lot of coverage on energy, a special issue. Uh, looking at biofuels, for example. We did a cover piece on soil conservation, uh, where food begins. Uh, in 2013, we looked at hydraulic fracturing. Uh, in 2010, we did a whole issue on global freshwater, uh, emerging issues around that. As part of the climate coverage, we looked at the rise of extreme weather and what's causing it. Uh, and we, after, um, Hurricane Sandy, we took a look at the impact of rising seas, that cover with uh, the Statue of Liberty. That water level is best estimate of what water levels would look like if all the ice on the planet were to melt. That would be Greenland and uh, Antarctica and continental glaciers. In 2011, we did a series on world population. It was a year-long series looking at sort of what does 7 billion mean? What are its implications for now and the future of the planet? And then in 2014, I was behind the creation of a series on uh, world f food security and how are we going to feed the planet as the population keeps going forward. And the focus of today's talk really is on this idea that there are other kinds of photography that we can use to ha help us understand how the planet works. And this, for example, this uh, thunderhead over Australia, uh, this was taken from the International Space Station, and I'm going to show you quite a few pictures from that. But this, for example, this is taken by a satellite from the moon of the Earth in uh, 2015. And I'll actually show you something later uh, where a satellite is showing us the dark side of the moon. And so as part of this issue that we published in, in November of last year, uh, uh, I was re very interested in trying to do something that, that helped explain what we, what we are learning about how the planet works by using things like satellites, astronaut photography, and, and, and aerial photography. Because what it is is essentially it's like uh, increasingly this kind of imaging is, is essentially like an EKG of the planet. And so we're quantifying changes that we're seeing on Earth. This is... The Okavango Delta in Botswana, and it was taken by the space station. And the idea really here was that what we're trying to do is uh, uh, explain what all these satellites do. What do we learn from these satellites? And, and they monitor things like atmosphere, land temperatures, ocean chemistry, ocean elevation. Uh, it, they can do things like monitor uh, disappearance of groundwater. Uh, what, perhaps one of the most um, visible or dramatic uh, indications of what these satellites do uh, is here a satellite that monitors the Arctic ice cap. And in 1979, this is the first picture that was taken of the Arctic ice cap at the end of the summer, looking at what the ice cap, how big it was after the summer's melt. And so this is 1979, this is 2012. So about half of it has disappeared. So these are the kinds of things that we're able to see by using these kinds of remote uh, images. 
Uh, for years, there have been what have been called Landsat, and that's visible light satellites. And a good, a, a vivid example of what we learned by using those, for example, is this is the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada in 2010, and this is the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada last year. So what you see is change. It allows us to understand that there are changes underway. And we used that pair of pictures in the stories, left, right, so you could get a sense that this, these images allow us to under, see how the planet is changing. But one of my main reasons I had for wanting to do this story actually centered on the work of a scientist named Gregory Asner, who's at the Carnegie Institution at Stanford University. And what he has developed in concert with scientists at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory is a, is a special kind of sensor that allows uh, him to uh, monitor actually the health of forests. How they are respiring, are they soaking up carbon? How healthy are they? What kind of species are they? Uh, here we see his airplane. He was over the um, Sierra last summer monitoring. He was trying to figure out forest health, looking at how dry several of the, of the forests were in the Sierra Nevada during drought. And so what, he, what the deal is here is that this is a... Um, uh, this is a special sensor that's multispectral, they call it. So when we have a normal camera, you have a regular camera, it sees in red, green, and blue. And that's visible light. And what this sensor does, it's special in the sense that it has to stay cold. They keep it at slightly above uh, absolute zero or it's something like a minus 180 degrees Fahrenheit. They have to keep this sensor at so that it works. But what it's doing, it's monitoring all wavelengths of light from infrared to ultraviolet, and it's continuous. And so it's seeing things that we don't see, but it's revealing things to us that are very useful as to, for us to understand. And here's, for example, the, the development of the sensor at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. So what's the deal here? What does it do? So if you take a look here, this is what we normally see. That's visible light. That's what we normally see when we look down on a forest. But what that sensor sees is this. It sees these different colors. And what they're doing, actually, uh, he has graduate students who climb trees, take leaves. They bring them back to the laboratory in, at Stanford. And what, they, what they're able to do now is by using that multispectral sensor, the variations in the colors here are telling him how healthy are trees. In general, red means they're richer, healthier, fuller, more full of carbon. They can also uh, determine species of trees by using this, this, these tools. So in one sense, what he's now able to do is by flying over forests, not only can he determine the health of the forest, he can also tell what kind of forest there are. And so that's part of what he does, but also they have, they have a, a, another part to the sensor on the airplane that allows them to see through the forest, through all the plants down to the land, and show, it's called LIDAR, it's a radar, and this is, for example, a um, river in Peru. But what's interesting is the LIDAR not only shows the current stream, it shows all the historical uh, flows of the streams. So in some sense, learning about that helps us understand what has changed in the landscape over time. And so what he does, what they do is they combine this, this sort of multispectral imaging that reveals the health of the trees with this terrain knowledge from LIDAR, and they start building what's called carbon maps. And so what they do... What they do is then they fly, it's like lawn mowing. This is uh, Panama. And so he's flying this airplane over Panama, building what is essentially this map of the force of Peru. And what you're seeing here then is what you're seeing is this is a carbon, the carbon geography of Panama. And he's done them for uh, Costa Rica and Ecuador. And the goal is to put this sensor on a satellite so that they can actually then map carbon in, these, in all these tropical forests around the world to try to figure out how healthy they are. So what he sees, 
when he flies over the forest, it's something like this. It's, you see, and this is the false color, but what you're seeing, red is healthy, different colors, they understand what these are. And then because they've gone up and they've um, clipped leaves and things, they actually can geolocate these trees and they can co co um, coordinate between what they found on the ground with what they see from the air, and they can begin to build a library of knowledge about what kinds of trees there are in the forest. Well, what this leads to actually then, this is actually the first picture that was ever published. Uh, in the summer of 2014, NASA launched a, um, a carbon mon monitoring satellite. The thing about CO2 is you can't see it, and it's like its presence, its increasing amount in the, in the in the atmosphere is one of the biggest issues as we're trying to understand how how the climate is changing and how we're contributing to that as we do things like burn fossil fuels or we deforest landscapes, change land use. And so what the deal is is that this satellite, it, this is the first picture ever taken of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere where it is, how much concentration there is. And what's really interesting about this particular picture, it was taken in uh, late spring last year. And the thing that's noticeable here is if you look up here in Canada and you look across Siberia, what you see here is the green. So if orange is high levels of CO2 uh, in the atmosphere over landscapes, what that's showing us is that all those big forests in Siberia and Canada, they're coming in, into bloom in, in the spring and they're soaking up. They're soaking up CO2, just like what happens like around here when all the leaves start coming out. The trees are soaking up carbon. And this is a really important uh, quality that, that we need to understand not only how we're producing carbon, but what is the natural world doing to soak it up. And this, so this is one of the very first images. This satellite is, they're, they're, they're building data from it. And the goal is to essentially produce something like this. This is an animation that was done uh, 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 from a supercomputer, which is what they hope to replicate with this satellite. This is how carbon moves in the atmosphere. This is a year in the life of CO2. Uh, and it, this was uh, approximating what it looks like in 2006. So if we can do this in real time, it's going in real time in terms of using that data from that uh, OCO2 satellite, it's called Orbiting Carbon Observatory. It's going to go a long way to help us understand how carbon cycles on the planet and how we can, how we can uh, do things like maybe plant more forests to uh, cut it. So let's take a step back. You know, we haven't been looking at the planet as a whole for very long. This is actually the very first picture that was ever taken of Earth from a, from a remote, uh, from a satellite. This was in October uh, 1966, first image of the Earth, and this was from the moon. And then this image actually was taken, I think it was Apollo 8, 1968. This was actually, this image was one that became uh, famous. Uh, it was taken, I think, on Christmas Eve, and it was the sort of the first time we'd been able to see the little blue planet out in space all alone like that. And it was influential in spawning things like the environmental movement and an awareness that we were we were the ones who were going to take care of this planet. And then what happened was that then we've increasingly, it's sort of like we've, we've got better lenses and better cameras. And so this is what the picture of the Earth looked like in 72 of the whole Earth. It, it graced the cover of the whole Earth catalog, if any of you remember that. But by 2014, look, it's almost like we cleaned our glasses. We got really high-quality lenses. So we got the, the dirt off. And so we're getting a much better uh, uh, quality image of the Earth. And we're even doing things now like being able to image the Earth at night. So uh, the, the technology is advancing. And then this, this, I talked earlier about this. So this is actually was taken from a satellite last year, and what this is an animation that's going to show the moon. This is from the dark side of the moon as the moon passes uh, in front of the Earth. 
That's something I myself had never seen before. So all of these things, to me, they're, for me, I'm basically one of those people who's just kind of ongoing curious. And it's like most all of this stuff that I'm showing you is out there in the public domain if you know where to look for it. And I'll get at that in a bit. So one thing that's also quite interesting by using this remote sensing is that you can show change over time. And this is, for example, a time lapse of the Yellow River Delta in China from 1989 to 2009. And what you see is uh, changes in sedimentation from 89 to 95, 99. See, so we're seeing change. It's a great way to understand how change is unfolding. This is typically sedimentation from, from erosion, from agriculture, this kind of thing. Now, uh, some of you may have heard of ca Canadian oil sands or tar sands. Canada is actually the largest foreign oil supplier to the United States currently. And largely, that oil supply is coming from central Alberta, where, where uh, boreal forests are being removed uh, in, in order to get at what's called the bitumen sands that, are, that, are, that carry the tar that then is refined into oil. So I'm going to show you this was, these are Landsat pictures starting in 84 that show the very, the beginnings of the mining and then over time what happened as a result of the expansion of the mine. So this is all, the, all this kind of stuff is available publicly. And largely what I've done, and I've just gone into the NASA websites and built this stuff myself. And you too, it's available for anybody who wants to do it. So this is what it looks like from a satellite. This is what it looks like from the ground. Uh, the RLC, for those of you who were here yesterday, you saw this, but this is uh, a dramatic representation of what happens to surface lakes. Uh, the RLC used to be the uh, world's largest, fourth largest uh, freshwater lake. But uh, starting in about 2000, uh, they started diverting freshwater from it for upstream uses so the water never reached it. They diverted it for things like irrigation. And eventually, the, over time, by 2014, the, the lake has largely dried up. Here's another example, the Columbia Glacier in Alaska, uh, what it has lo looks like from 1986 to 2014. This is how long it was. You can see how the ice came down in 86 into the tidal regions, and that's the same glacier in 2014. So what these, what we can learn is we can actually quantify change. We can see that there's change ongoing on the planet. So as part of my research in doing this story, I actually spent several weeks mining the whole um, library of images that were being taken by the um, uh, astronauts on the International Space Station. And these are the resources that I was using to do that. NASA Earth Observatory is um, it's a, it's a public open source repository for public domain images produced by satellites. And you can go in and download uh, images. They put up new images every day. And also the gateway to astronaut photography of the Earth. And it it, what it holds is the images that have been produced by the scientists in the space station. And they have built these collections, and you can go in and look at them and, and uh, download them. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of the pictures that I found. This is from the period of 2012 through 2015. These are images that somebody with a Nikon camera has been shooting out the window of the space station and then uh, archiving them. So all those all those dots on the map, those are all places where they have taken pictures of the Earth. And it's, this is the, uh, the space station that they're, they float around in. Here, for example, this is the California coast in the Central Valley of California. This was taken uh, last year. And then here, for example, is the same location generally at night. So you see on the left side, you see San Francisco. Over the right is... Uh, uh, L.A. in the middle there is the Central Valley. We're up to the left. And then the green up there, um, those are the northern lights. 
Uh, this image of the Pacific Northwest was taken last February. If you look right here, this is where we are right now. Here's Portland up here. That's where I grew up. And you can see the Columbia River going all the way up into British Columbia and the Rockies. But then, you know, we live on the uh, Pacific Ring of Fire, and the, there are volcanoes active all around. This is on the Kamchatka Peninsula. It's sort of on the opposite side of the Pacific Ocean that is sort of our, their analog to our Cascade Range. Uh, these are thunderstorms over Borneo in the southwest Pacific. Uh, this, this is uh, uh, streams in uh, the Himalayas. You can see the snow. I mean, the, what inter is interesting to me is that the patterns there that you see with the streams and their tributaries is very akin to like if you... If you pull leaves off of trees and look at the veins and the circulation, it's the same general pattern that you see there. Now, this is the Green River in Utah, and there appears to be a flaw in this picture. If you look in the top left, and there's a white line that goes from top left down to the left part in the left side, that is a commercial jet airplane. Uh, on the southwest coast of, Namib of, of Africa is the Namib Desert. And uh, uh, often what happens, you see this in the Sahara, also the Namib. It's what you see a lot of sand blowing off the desert into the ocean. And that's what we're seeing here is sand being blown by the winds. This is Scandinavia and the Northern Lights, taken by um, the, the astronauts. Uh, you can also reveal poverty or economic development or not. What we are seeing here actually is South Korea, China, and the dark spot in the middle is North Korea at night. They don't have much electricity. This is, uh, if you look what you see, these lines here, these are seaweed farms off the coast of South uh, Korea. And here in the United States, we're looking southeast, so there's Cape Cod in the foreground, uh, uh, Long Island in the middle, and then uh, New York right behind. Uh, these are forest fires near Darwin, Australia. Uh, this may be, I'm not sure, this could be where some sort of meteor landed, but we're looking at actually the Sahara Desert. And then further east in Iran, you get these amazing patterns. This is uh, the Kabir Desert in Iran, as is this, which has these very abstract patterns to it. Uh, this one is intriguing. What we are seeing here are uh, fortifications on the Iran-Iraq border, right? So they've been in hostilities for a very long time. And so what you're seeing there are all the various military emplacements. Uh, this is the uh, Great Sandy Desert in Australia, all taken by people uh, floating around the planet. I think it was Scott Kelly who spent a year up there doing a lot of this work. He was very much a photography fan and was putting a lot of this stuff out on social media. This is the coastline of Morocco. That would be in, in the northwest Saharan Desert in Africa, so where it meets the, the um, Atlantic. This is up in North Dakota, Lake Sharp, in the middle of the winter. And that l l loop in the middle, so what you're seeing then is you're seeing the water in the big part, and then you're seeing snow-covered uh, circle irrigation uh, installations in the middle. This is uh, ancient Arkansas River meanders. And what's interesting here is so you see the river but then you see the river itself, but then if you look up here, what you see is historically these are places where the river used to be long ago. Uh, this is uh, Manhattan from straight above, taken, I think it's about 180 miles up. He's using something like a 400 millimeter lens to do this. Uh, this is Chicago in the loop in Lake Michigan. Uh, this is Phoenix at night, so you get to see the street grid. I mean, they're, to me, they're fascinating because you don't, we hardly ever see these kinds of things, and yet this is, this is sort of the tableau, the palette of the, the planet we live on. 
This is Sicily and Italy and the Mediterranean at night. One thing these new digital cameras with higher speed sensors has really been helpful to for, for uh, making this kind of photography possible. So this is a movie, and we're flying, we're flying over the Mediterranean. I think it's flying east from Gibraltar across the Mediterranean. Okay, the last part uh, is actually, it's an experiment, and I'm doing this partly because I like to take pictures myself too, but what I've been doing for the last few years, partly the idea here is that it's, you know, you can do some of this yourself too if you happen to have to fly or you're in airplanes, you can find a, a window seat. And so what I'm going to show you actually are some images that I've been doing from 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 travels across the America the last uh, several years, and uh, d uh, I'll, I'll describe to you how I have gone about identifying some of these places because it's sometimes difficult. Uh, this was go flying from Chicago to Des Moines. That's with an iPhone. Uh, this was a picture I took of the Columbia River Gorge, and I had no business being here at this time. I was supposed to be in L.A., and the only reason that I took this was because some flights had been canceled, and, and I happened to fly into Portland at sunrise on the longest day, on, on the first day of summer in 2014. Now this, and that's like with a point-and-shoot camera. These are all from commercial airliners. Now this picture is 20 pictures in one. And the thing about this, is, this is Lake Tahoe. And so later that same day, the same day I just took the previous picture, I was going, I was sitting in the last row of the plane going, oh, right, Tahoe's going to come up. And we were flying down the east side of the Cascades and down the east, eastern slope of the Sierra Nevada. And I was going, hmm, I wonder if I can take a picture of Lake Tahoe. So I had an iPhone, iPhone 4S. I was sitting in the back row of the airplane. And what I did is I held the phone up to the window and didn't move for 10 minutes. And about every 20 seconds, I would take a picture with the phone, click, click, and just held the phone as we moved past Lake Tahoe until it was gone. And then about two weeks later, I was able to come back and put it together. And so it was, I put about 20 images together to build this picture. So you're looking at a multi-image panorama of Lake Tahoe. Uh, these are other pictures. This is Pyramid Lake in Nevada. This was flying east to west uh, towards San Francisco. This is the same lake with a different view. I mean, these are just regular digital pictures that and uh, you have to tone them a little bit because there's a lot of air pollution sometimes. This is uh, the Salton Sea, getting on, got on a route from uh, uh, Washington to San Diego. Uh, this is the Sacramento River Delta as you're flying east from where the San Joaquin and the Sacramento are coming together. Uh, this is the eastern shore of Lake Michigan uh, flying east to Lansing, and that, all, what that is is ice during breakup in the spring. And coming back three days later, that was Chicago again. Another view, a different view, kind of like what you saw from the space station. This is Cicero. This is one of the neighborhoods in south, south Chicago. This is with a point-and-shoot camera, just stuck out the window of, not stuck out, but <laughs> pointing out. Right, I broke out the windows. and uh, Flying into St. Louis, this is the Mississippi River. Uh, you can see the, if you see down there, it's hard to see, but you can see the St. Louis Arch. Uh, this is Cleveland. Cincinnati at night. Uh, this is New York. Uh, this is Washington, D.C. That's the Anacostia River, and then the Potomac River is up on the top left. We're looking west. That's RFK Stadium, and then the, the, the capital is in the center. Uh, this is the East L.A. Freeway. Uh, this is further east in California. This is a town called Quartzsite off I-10 out in the middle of the desert. Uh, this is a solar power installation in Southern California in the desert. 
uh, the San Juan Mountains in southwest Colorado. Uh, this is uh, Utah Lake in Provo flying east from San Francisco. Uh, this is a Navajo National Monument in Arizona. Uh, so all taken with uh, typically regular DSLRs. I often, the strategy is I will try to figure out one, like if I'm flying east or west, generally I'll try to get it in a seat on the north side so that I'm not dealing with reflections from the sun because the windows in these planes are often pretty terrible, scratched, plastic. I mean, that's kind of one of the biggest things you're fighting against. This is the Grand Canyon last year taken with an iPhone. Uh, this is Lake Powell in Arizona. That's the big reservoir behind Glen Canyon Dam, one of the two big uh, reservoirs on the Colorado River that provide water for places like this is Sun City, Arizona in western Arizona. Suburban development. The, the, the design of the suburban environment to me is, is uh, quite intriguing. This is uh, Rancho Mirage in Palm Desert in California, directly east of, of Los Angeles. So this is all dependent upon imported water. Uh, we hear about the shift in sh shopping patterns in the United States. This is a dead mall near St. Louis, <coughs> unoccupied. Quite a few of these in the U.S. now. Uh, this picture intrigued me. One, this is uh, near Winnipeg, Canada, and what was intriguing to me was that these, uh, this land was gridded just like it is in, in the Midwest of the United States. And what happened was that, you know, the, the land in Canada was surveyed on the same grid as it was in the United States. And only, I think, in the 60s did Canada transition to the metric system. So all their land was surveyed in the same way on miles, square miles, as it is in the U.S. Uh, this is farmland east of Denver. Uh, and then I've been looking at some of these resource questions. These are, um, that's a cattle feedlot in, and uh, circle irrigation for growing crops. This is in the Texas Panhandle. Uh, this is a hog feeding operation in northwest Kansas. Uh, trying to figure out what it was, I actually, I often will show you an example of how I try to identify this stuff. I use Google Earth often because I can't use, if I have, can't, if you are able to use GPS on, a, on an airplane, it, it helps a lot because it shows you where you are. But most of the time I can't because even if you have a GPS attachment on a camera, it doesn't work inside the aluminum cocoon. And what this is, is I couldn't find this on, on, the, um, on Google Earth. Uh, when I took it, it was so brand new. But, uh, but I was able to identify the location of this by this creek right here. And that house, those are what allowed me to figure out where this was. And finally, Google Earth was updated. This is a, this is a hog feeding operation uh, in northwest Kansas near Price City. And what we see here are 180 barns. Each one is a barn. There are 180 barns here. Each one of those barns holds about 1,000 animals. Uh, this is hydraulic fracturing near Odessa, Texas. I'm going to show you a new variant that I did just a couple of weeks ago on this. Odessa is west central Texas. This is where you get, uh, this is where much of the hydraulic fracturing for oil and gas has been. This is in the northeast corner of Texas near the, the uh, Oklahoma border near a town called Allison. This is all natural gas. This is what the landscape looks like when we're drilling for these resources. Uh, I was flying from Houston to Washington last year. We've heard about mount mountaintop removal mining. And what we're seeing here are two op op uh, mountaintop mines uh, near uh, Pikeville, Kentucky, along the summit of the Appalachian Mountains. Okay, these, I'm down to three, and then I'll be done, and then we can talk. This next one is... Uh, this was an experiment. I did this about two weeks ago. And what this is was I've been intrigued by this idea of doing panoramic images. So I thought, well, gee, I wonder if I can do a pano from a flying airplane. It's going, you know, however, 600 miles an hour. And this is, this is um, a place called Dell City. It's in southwest Texas. If you drew a line straight down from the eastern New Mexico border into Texas, you would come across it. It's a very distinctive feature. And so right in the middle here, you see this, the town. 
And so what I did was I actually took, I did nine pictures as I was flying. I went boom, 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 boom. And then I took them and stitched them together using Photoshop Lightroom, and this is what came out. So what happened to me, what the deal is, is the perspective that you get from these kinds of images creates a very, it's a distinctive look at the landscape. So how do I know this is this? Well, so here is, here is the, here's Tell City, Texas from Google Earth. So I spend a lot of time, if I'm not, if I'm not um, sure where I am, I spend a lot of time in Google Earth moving things around going, oh, is this that? What did I just shoot? And then once I get that, I'll take the, I'll get the GPS coordinates off Google Earth, and then I'll paste them into the metadata of the original image, so that then I can come back. And then this last one, I'm going to show you this one. Actually, this one uh, was later that same flight, and what we see here is an oil and gas fields uh, in western Texas. And this is a combination of six images taken all within like four seconds, and I put them together. And so the question was, well, where is it exactly? So I was actually trying to pin this down this morning so I could be sure when I told you that I knew what I was talking about. It took me about 20 minutes. And so here, for example, here we are in West Texas. There's, there's something like that there. See, I spend my whole time moving things around, looking, can I find patterns that are distinctive and, and look the same? We're getting closer. Wicket, Texas, okay? There's Wicket. There's Wicket there. Look at those two features right there. Voila, there it is, see? So that's how I had to locate a lot of these things. And so it's like, for me, it's kind of a, kind of an investigation, but it, to me it's also it's an amazing way to take a different kind of look at the world and show it that I actually have never seen before. And the last picture I'm going to show you is uh, I was landing in Washington, oh, three years ago after a heavy rainstorm and there had been some construction in the area and there had been quite a lot of um, uh, erosion from runoff. This is soil erosion in, uh, uh, along the eastern shore of the Potomac River after a storm. So you see this is, you get a lot of siltation, but it made for a very dramatic image. So there you are. I'm just trying to show you some things that may pique your interest about how to explore the world, learn about the world, and I'm certainly happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Okay. You're talking. Oh, there we go. Yes, ma'am. Resources for finding photos. I missed the first one. Oh well, there's NASA Earth Observatory. That was the first one. Yeah, that's a pretty common one, and they update that a lot, and they usually put up a, a fresh image every day, and and they have a whole library of these. I showed you those time lapse things. They have a whole section of the website that they've devoted to. Uh, uh, a whole variety of changes, like off the coast of Dubai, they built islands. And you can see over time the islands grow. Sure. Yes, sir. Me? <laughs> Not, well, I threw about, flew about 100,000 miles last year. So, But I think the key thing is if you're going to try to do it is try to, if you can get a window seat on the north side and then hope that the plane's not too old and the windows aren't too cracked because that tends to be the biggest limitation. So, you know, I mean, it'd be great if you had your own airplane and you could commandeer it. And I mean, a lot of this is, you know, the light's not that great, right? And it'd be great if you could fly at those beautiful times a day. But I think I'm just really trying to say that it's possible for, for anybody who was curious and wanted to do this kind of work. Uh, it's amazing what you see out the windows of planes. I typically like, yeah, I'm one of those guys who they're, all, they're always complaining about who has his window open while they want to watch the movies, right? Because I'm out looking out the window watching the country go by. Yes, sir. Do the CO2 levels change with the seasons? And are there other gases that you can check too, like methane? Uh, I don't know about the, yeah, I think that they use different sensors on a different satellite to do methane, but in fact, actually, uh, I have a graph in a, from another presentation, but in fact, actually, CO2 levels do change by the season, and, and imagine what the deal is, is the northern hemisphere is where most of the deciduous trees are across 
the planet. And uh, for years, they've been monitoring the CO2 levels at uh, uh, the Scripps Observatory. Uh, they, they have a CO2 monitoring station at, on, um, in Hawaii uh, at the top of one of the mountains. And what it shows is that within each year, the CO2 goes up and down, up and down, up and down. But it keeps going up at more than three parts per million now. It's over 400. But that intra-annual change, the up and down is actually, it's going down within the year when all the trees in the spring are leafing out and soaking up carbon. And then by the summer and into the fall, when the leaves are mature and they start falling off, is when you see the rise in CO2 uh, uh, as those in, within the year as the leaves are dying. Can you, can you see methane from these big pile farms? Uh, you can actually, there. I have seen images that have been published recently that show uh, methane leaks from natural gas uh, drilling uh, fields in like, was it North Dakota? Those images are out there. So it's, but the concentration of methane from hog farms, I haven't seen pictures of that, but it's a lot of the leaks, le methane leaking is coming from natural gas fields that there's some, some leakage happening during the drilling. It yes, sir. Most of the CO2 levels were concentrated along the equator. Wow. Yeah, you see, I think the thing with that particular image is, one, it's tough to draw definitive conclusions from the first image that was produced by this satellite. And it, like a lot of things, I think uh, if we come back in a year or two, they're going to have a better sense of what they're seeing and why they're seeing certain things. But for the most part, uh, high CO2 levels are, are noticed perpetually along the east coast of the United States. On the, e on the eastern coast of Southeast Asia. There's lots of industrial development there. There's a lots of urban development in the eastern US, and the same thing goes for Europe. But once you, get, once you get up into places like the forest, that's where you actually see where it's soaking up the CO2. OK, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Huh. What has been the most important impact? Well, I know that this story was very popular with our readers. I think it was, it was open. It opened people's uh, eyes to the idea that this kind of observation was available, and that we were actually. The, I think the paradox is you have NASA, which you think National Air, Aeronautics and Space Administration, they're supposed to be taking pictures of space, but now they've been actually trying to. Uh, gain an understanding of how Earth is working and what we're doing to change the Earth. And I think that's probably one of the biggest revelations that uh, we realize that we can use these same kinds of tools that we've been using to learn about space. If we point them at our own home, that helps us become better stewards of the planet we live on. Yes, sir. In my few travels across the country, in the air, I'm always fascinated when I look out the window and see farmland, you see just land as far as the eye can see. And constantly across the U.S. you see these little spot fires out of no, in the middle of nowhere. There's no city, no, uh, far, no, no uh, farmhouse, no nothing, just spot fires. And I've often wondered, what, what uh, Sometimes uh, those spot fires, uh, well, maybe somebody's burning brush, but oftentimes what happens is, uh, like you see this in the Great Plains quite a bit, they burn the grass to get rid of uh, get rid of weeds and diseases in the soil, and and it's like when the natives used to do that before the Europeans settled the uh, the, the plains. They 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 did that because then it gave the plants a new beginning, and it cleaned off the old, and it's kind of a revitalization. It's actually the same thing. So I grew up. I grew up in Clackamas County, and I can remember as a kid, the grass seed farmers would light the fields on fire, and you'd see big billows of smoke all over the Willamette Valley late in the summer. It's exactly the same reason, trying to clean the soil, kill, kill the insects and bacteria that, that may cause disease. Yes, ma'am? Um, something I've been thinking about recently, uh, first of all, I really love all of these images, and I especially appreciate the images that show changes over time. Because you're yeah. Um, which is just so striking. But when we think too about photography and 
some of the most compelling images and the most memorable images often have a person in them, yep. a human face, our eyes are drawing human faces in photography. So from an environmental photo perspective and climate change and getting people to care about the environment and earth, I'm just be curious to know your thoughts about the humanity and, and, and kind of that divide between people who people in these types of images and just your thoughts on that. Yeah, I guess I should have had you at yesterday's and the day before's talks because that's what those were all about. And this really was just kind of a, a sort of a different angle into all this. No, I think that that's, it's, it's, you're absolutely right. I think that the thing about photography though, and admittedly, I think that there, I run into a lot of people who just don't really care for this kind of photography because it's this kind of abstract remote stuff. But once you understand what it's showing you, it's insightful. And yes, the, the part about the emotional part. Look, I think the most imp compelling photographs that we've published or appeal, that have appeal are ones that on one hand have this sort of intellectual or informative aspect to them, but they also appeal to your emotions simultaneously. And, and I think one thing that, that, that is important though to do when you're, when you're doing photography of environmental issues that you, you need to be careful to not over dramatize the emotional component at the expense of, of being accurate in what you're representing. Because it's easy, I think, it's easy to make extreme arguments that don't have a basis in reality. For example, the, the, the project that we published, I showed it at the beginning in 2004, it was called Global Warning Bulletins from a Warring World. We had a lot of people in there who were like losing their homes because of the rising season in, in say, or they were losing the shorelines in Alaska and other situations. But what we did though, we made sure that every picture situation in that project was also tied to some peer-reviewed published study about climate science. Anybody else? Yes, Tarson. So I wanted to follow up on that because one of the questions I had was, <clears throat> if you bit, do we learn things from this kind of photography, then that, that can then help us do better Absolutely. photography when we're on the ground photographing kind of on a, on a, in a you know, the distance are measured in feet and inches rather than Right. Miles. I think that this kind of thing, I mean, for example, uh, what it does is it helps us point us towards situations that become, that can fall more into this sort of um, combination of intellectual and emotional that you're asking about. And uh, that's actually, uh, for example, uh, uh, the time lapse stuff has been pretty uh, influential for us, but also uh, in combination with photographers I've worked with. For example, last in 2014, we did a big story on the disappearance of snowpack in the western United States. And we were, we, we were doing big panoramic landscape images to uh, represent the, the, the sort of the disappearance of snow in the west or some of the issues. And for example, uh, I used Google Earth to locate a camera position that would show Shasta Dam and Mount Shasta in the same picture in a way that was, so it was like helicopter time is really expensive. You fly from Reading and you go to some place and then you take a picture and hope it's gonna work. So by using something like Google Earth, I was able to essentially position where the picture should be taken I sent the GPS coordinates, latitude, longitude coordinates to the photographer. He and I were doing this collaboratively, and then he sent it to the helicopter pilot, and they put it into the programming on the helicopter. They flew right there and took, the, took a series of pictures that they made for the panorama. So what it does is, I mean, the, the Google Earth imaging to me is an amazing, I've already seen uh, people who take those images and turn them essentially into artwork. And uh, exhibit them in galleries. And it's really amazing if when you're looking down and seeing sort of all these transformations, it's like that that uh, picture, was it Sun City of Arizona that had the loops and everything? That's really an amazing picture. And so these kinds of, these, these remote imaging systems really help us a lot to figure out where the important places are. Yes, sir. So is any of your uh, photography, like the one, especially with the, with the uh, ice, the, the top North Pole, has any of that been able to influence public policy? I have no idea about that, but we, <laughs> uh, we actually have, uh, uh, we've actually published that, that pairing several times. And, you know, some people, uh, 
some people understand it. I think in some cases, no amount of facts are going to change some people's views on this. Right. So I think in, in, uh, over the longer term on these kinds of issues, I think the most important thing we can do if we're, if we're trying to communicate these kinds of ideas is to be persistent and to be um, relentless and continuous and just keep trying to tell the story of the change that we're seeing. For example, the first three months of this year are almost orders of magnitude warmer than last year, which was the warmest recorded year since 1880, which the year before was the warmest, so we're getting big upticks. Well, today's Register Guard, they talk about how everybody thinks it's stylish because... It's um, what? I'm sorry? In today's Register Guard, everybody thinks it's great because... Uh, nice you know, warm weather. Warm weather, the right. weather is nice. You know, we don't think about the, the summer. <laughs> right, right. If you don't have to depend upon snow to get you through the late summer. So, anybody else? All right, well, thank you so much for coming today. Appreciate it. <laughs>